The information in this broadcast is for educational purposes only and is not provided as a professional service, medical advice, or is it intended or implied to be a substitute for diagnosis or treatment. You are encouraged to confirm any information obtained from this broadcast with other sources and review all information regarding any medical condition or treatment with your physician and other appropriate health care providers. Hi, I'm Pete Levine. Welcome to Noggins and Neurons, Stroke and TBI Recovery Simplified. I'm a clinical instructor and clinical researcher. I've co-authored dozens of scientific journal articles about brain injury recovery, and I'm also the author of the book, Stronger After Stroke. I'm Deborah Battistella, occupational therapist, creator of the OT's Guide to Mirror Therapy, and an OT educator. I have a lot of experience working with survivors. Most of my clinical practice has been in a certified stroke center. Pete and I are especially interested in talking about what rehab, neuroscience, and clinical research all have to say about the brain and recovery. But don't worry, our job is to make this stuff simple. We're here to make it so that everyone, clinicians, clinical students, caregivers, and most importantly, the survivor, understands what it takes to leverage their great neuroplastic brain for recovery. Thank you for joining us today on Noggins and Neurons as Pete and I talk about spasticity. Quickly, before we get into our conversation, I want to remind you that last episode was called Research for Recovery. We talked about important points such as what to look for when starting off on a research path, systematic reviews and meta-analyses as a good sign that your topic is well investigated. Pete shared the history of evidence-based medicine and then we talked about reasons for applying the evidence to a recovery plan. The episode is full of detailed information to guide research, and I encourage you to check out the show notes as we added more than we were able to talk about in our conversation. Now let's move on to the topic of the day, spasticity. Now, the one thing that they do have is finger flexion. And often therapists say, you cannot let them flex the fingers. Because if you do, you will strengthen the overwhelmingly strong flexors. And if you do that, you will make spasticity worse, which is not true. Spastic muscles are weak. So even if you strengthen them, it wouldn't be the end of the world. But you're not trying to strengthen them. You're just trying to activate them. How are you going to reestablish brain control over the finger flexors if you don't allow them to flex the fingers? But what about a ball, a squishy ball? Who doesn't like a squishy ball? You squish into the ball, it reestablishes brain control over the flexors, thereby reducing spasticity. That's the whole thing. when we do this yeah yeah but i think we're burning a lot of calories the brain burns a lot of calories man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. evolutionarily it makes no sense oh, oh. oh i know there we go okay i have all my questions here hey can i can i hear him up front that might be helpful it's a good idea um it's cheating but i'm willing to cheat Sometimes it helps us just start thinking because I always think of good stuff afterwards. So I think it's fair. Um, Well, well, one of the things I hope you're going to talk about is understanding spasticity because something that I read in the literature is that it's poorly understood. Is that still true or maybe you'll change that for me? I want to know your thoughts on always treating spasticity because in the literature I read is sometimes it can make it so that somebody can transfer their sitting posture is better because when spasticity is treated that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's strength is going to return. And then you know, I want to know about like tens units and then splinting your thoughts on splinting. And when to treat it too, that whole that whole thing came up, you know, getting ahead of it. And I also am curious about your thoughts on Botox. 
Well, the good news is I'm going to talk about all that. Okay, great. I guess that's the good news. I don't know. I feel like I'm going to just kind of be like in the back seat of a car along for the ride. Yeah. On this one. Right. I'm sorry about that. But no. As, as I mentioned, this is a really important one to me. And I, I'm frightfully nervous about it. So I'm hoping to, to get it right. But let's do it. Yeah, let's just do it. Okay. Hey, Deb Adicella, how are you doing? Pete, I'm great. It's been a while since I've seen you and you look pretty much the same. (laughs) Well, just to be honest with people, we do two episodes in a row that we record and they're separated by about a half an hour break. So Deb's absolutely right. She saw me 15 minutes ago or half an hour ago, I guess. So how are you? I'm I'm doing great. Did you change your hair in that half hour? That's amazing. (laughs) No. All right, we've gotten silly. Yeah. We're here to talk about a very serious subject, something that I'm actually really interested in, and uh, it's spasticity. How to control it, what works, what doesn't work, how to conceptualize it, what things are Band-Aids, what things are permanent. And then I want to talk about something I'm very proud of, the neuroplastic model of spasticity reduction. And I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole, but I do want to tell a quick story. So years ago, I was doing a talk... And it wasn't super well attended. There was probably 20 people there, but there was two unusual people. Um, It was a two-day talk. It was in a rehab hospital. One of the people was a physiatrist. I've done talks to to docs, um, but it wasn't usual in one of my talks that weren't to docs for a doc to show up. So that was kind of intimidating. A physiatrist, he knows a lot. Another person that showed up was one of the co-founders of the company Sabo. Um, Yeah. Anybody who knows anything about stroke recovery knows the Sabo Flex and the Sabo Stretch, and they make really sort of bleeding edge, but simple conceptualized technologies to help stroke survivors get better. It was run and founded by two brothers, John and Henry. I always called them John Henry. Um, John Farrell and Henry Hoffman, they have different last names. I think they're half brothers. Anyway, Henry Hoffman now runs the company, but John Farrell was a guy and I, I went to their course down in South Carolina or whatever it was. We were thinking about using, trying out their Saboflex for a clinical trial. So I went down there to get trained on it. And um, and the thing was really dominated by this guy, Ch- John Farrell. Now, now, I'll tell you what this guy looks like, just to give you a, a sense of this. If you had 100 people, they're both OTs, by the way, and John Farrell's an OT. If you had 100 people and you lined them up in a long line, you said, which one of these people is not an OT? You would say it was John Farrell. The guy looks like a construction worker. He swears like a somebody in the Navy and he smokes constantly. And I'm like, John, you know, smoking causes stroke. You know that, don't you? And he says, yeah, but if I have a stroke, I'm going to know what to do. I was like, you should probably send do that, John. But anyway, John Farrell helped me with this neuroplastic model. He had come up with the technology, the Sabo Flex, that did it. We had come up with a treatment option, modified constraint-induced therapy, that also did it. That is, change the brain so that the brain recontrolled the muscles that were spastic. So let me unpack all this, and what we'll get to is this neuroplastic model of spasticity reduction. Is it poorly understood? That was one of your questions. It is poorly understood. Let me give you a couple of the stats, though. Spasticity is undertreated, no doubt about it. Worldwide, there's about 12 million people that have spasticity. That's a lot of people. It is. 80% of people with cerebral palsy have spasticity. Cerebral palsy or CP is a brain injury that happens before the first year of life. A lot of people with CP are people that had an in utero stroke. I forget the stats, but it's a huge amount of people with CP had their stroke, but had it in utero. 80% of them have spasticity and about 60% of stroke survivors have spasticity. Okay, let me give you the dictionary definition of spasticity. And in my classes, I used to do this. I said, if anybody can read this whole thing in one breath, I'll give you a free book. And I think I gave one free book away. I did this for years. Nobody could ever do it. And the guy who at least got to the end of it, uh, he kind of cheated and mumbled over some words. But here it is. The dictionary definition of spasticity. I'm going to try to do it in one breath. It's going to be ridiculous. (sighs) Got to hyperventilate first here. (sighs) Spasticity corresponds to an exaggeration of monosynaptic reflex from 1A fibers to alpha motor neurons associated with spinal hyperreflexibility. The spinal segmental reflexes require the participation of muscle spindles, fusing motor innervations, gamma motor neurons, 1A primary afferents, and alpha motor neurons, as well as Renchard reoccurring inhibition, disynaptic reciprocal inhibition, non reciprocal autogenic 1B inhibition. <sighs> Couldn't do it. Presynaptic inhibition and remote inhibition slash excitation of alpha motor neurons. But here's the funny part about that definition. The exact mechanism remains unclear. 
Yep. Wow. So all those words. And all those words not, to say they really don't know. They really don't know. And it's a tough one. It's a tough one to get your head around, but I think I can make it scientifically accurate and easy to understand. But let's go back to what clinicians often do because that really complicated one makes no sense to them. And I bet I could get neurologists, read them that, and they would say something like, um, well, I could probably unpack it if you give me 20 minutes. I've had people that teach physiology in my courses and I'm like, oh, you teach physiology. Can you explain this to us? And they'll be like, give me 20 minutes and I'll unpack it for you. So it is quite complicated. So what therapists and other clinicians often do is they make it too simple. They'll say things like, spasticity is an involuntary muscle tightness and stiffness. They blame the muscle. That does not sound like what you just read. It's a co-contraction. They blame the muscle. Increased muscle tone. They blame the muscle. Continually contracted muscles. Resistance to passive movement. All of these are local explanations. It's like blaming the victim. It doesn't tell the whole story. It just tells the tail end of the story. It's like saying, um, I'm going to tell you the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. Just then, Goldilocks woke up. She saw the three bears. She screamed, help. And she jumped up and ran out of the room. Goldilocks ran down the stairs, opened the door, ran away into the forest, and she never returned to the home of the three bears again. That's what all this talk about spasticity is. It's clinicians in rehab often have this problem. If they can't see it, they can't conceptualize it. The muscle, they can measure. They can do the modified ash work to see if they have spasticity. They can see if the spasticity has reduced the strength. So they can measure strength. And since that's what they they can see and they can measure, that's what they think the problem is. But the muscle is the victim here. It's not the perpetrator. If you want to blame something, blame the brain. And secondarily, the spinal cord. So here's a definition that's scientifically accurate and easy to understand. Spasticity is a reverberation of a monosynaptic stretch reflex. So take the patellar reflex, the one we all know. The doctor gets, gets a tomahawk-shaped reflex hammer and hits you in the patellar tendon over and over and over again. That's a monosynaptic stretch reflex. It goes from the patellar tendon because it's kind of a long story, but because that hammer puts the tendon on an overstretch, a very quick overstretch, muscles are very sensitive to overstretch. And so what they do is they shorten. And when the quads shorten and the patellar tendon is connected to the quads, when it shortens, it kicks your leg forward because the quads contract. And one of the things that the quads contracting does is it kicks your leg forward. It shortens that muscle at the top of the leg. Now, imagine if the doc did that to you over and over and over again forever. That's what spasticity is. What does it feel like? Let me ask you this, Deb. Do you ever get cramps at all, like muscular cramps? I sure do. Where do they usually show up? In my calf, sometimes in my hand. Wow, calf. The calf ones are bad. They are bad. You have to get out of bed for that. Yeah, you do. Weight bear. You can weight bear on that and that'll take it away. Imagine if you had, have you ever had a cramp that's so bad that the next day you have delayed onset muscle soreness? Yes. In fact, it happened to me when I was in anthropology school and I ended up calling the doctor because I thought, do I have a blood clot in my leg? Yeah, because DVT, which is a blood clot in the calf, it feels like a cramp. Yeah, I can see how you'd be concerned. Were you on an archaeological dig in the Olduvai Gorge uh, in uh, Eastern Africa? No, that would have been fun. You worked with Louis Leakey and his daughters and his son? No. I really wanted to go to Belize with the TA, but that didn't happen either. The teacher's assistant had a a dig going on? Yeah. Belize, huh? Yeah. Wow. I I don't know why. I imagine you like like Harrison Ford in Raiders of the Lost Ark with the hat and you're like chipping away at stuff and didn't happen. No. Well, you know... I had children at home. Yeah, you couldn't go to Belize. No. Yeah. Kids first. Kids first. The most neuroplastic event that you can have in your entire life is having and raising children. Yeah. And I got some research on that. Anyway, so that's what it feels like. Imagine having that calf cramp, but having it constantly. You can imagine how it drives people nuts. And that's what it feels like. It's all the time, except it's not all the time. Let me ask you this, Deb. This is completely unfair. When do you think that spastic muscles are not spastic? Is there any time that they're not? Given no intervention, no Botox or baclofen or something like that, is there any time when you can expect them not to be spastic? Completely unfair question. I'm so sorry. Well, I I, I don't think I fully understand the question. I mean, I know sometimes immediately following a stroke, people have flaccid limbs and there's no spasticity. That's true. Are you asking? Let's say they were five years post. And that person is spastic. Is there any time they, they think they might not be spastic without an intervention? 
This is a completely horrible question. It re- well, it is. I never even thought about. I, I I I don't know. I know spasticity isn't super in your wheelhouse, so I will tell you there is one time when they're not spastic, and so great, I get to teach you something. This is going to be cool. So in normal muscles, just to go back to the to defining the pathology, in normal muscles, you know, we have reflexes going all the time, but the brain inhibits those reflexes. There's extraordinary times when they're disinhibited. It's usually when something goes really badly. Have you ever lost? Lost your balance and your arms start to flail around in order to catch yourself? Yes, I have. Yes. I think we all have. Yes. We've all been ice skating. Whoa. Those are disinhibited reflexes. It's trying to keep you on balance. If you had to counterweight and weight yourself and think about the base of support and all these other things, you'd hit the deck. So your body, your your reflexes are just go immediately from the spinal cord. The brain's not even involved. The brain says, I am in such a panic and so overwhelmed right now. Spinal cord, do your thing. And these reflexes. Have you ever burned yourself on a pan and your hand is up by your ear? It looks almost like a flexor center before you can even feel the heat. And you're like, I am the fastest person in the world. That heat tried to get me, but it couldn't. That wasn't you. Because if it had gone up to the brain and been processed by 86 billion neurons, you would have had fried hand along with your fried eggs. So the brain gets out of the way. Monosynaptically, it goes from a nerve ending in your hand, afferently towards the spinal cord, quick reflexive arc, efferently back to the muscles that get your hand out of trouble. What usually happens is that those reflexes are inhibited, dampened down by the brain. But what if they have a brain injury? Now, all of a sudden, you can't dampen them down. And those reflexes are disinhibited. Muscle contractions are uncontrollable. And that's the story of spasticity. That's the simple story of spasticity. And it's one that clinicians and other people can use to kind of explain what's going on. Look at it this way. Spasticity is normally hidden reflexes becoming extraordinarily obvious. So you know how our reflexes integrate as we develop? from when we're born. Is this the re-emergence of those reflexes or not? Is that not the right way to think about it? I'm not sure if it's not or it is. Um, Reflexes, as they relate to movement, um, you're right. Infants have them. Over time, we learn to use those reflexes in order to move in a purposeful way. Yeah almost like an evolutionary growth in the human being throughout the early childhood, there's that growth that happens from a reflexive animal to an animal that where this very large brain controls things, unless we're in trouble. And then the reflexes reassert themselves. Now, one of the things that Eddie Taub did, oh, sorry, Edward Taub, PhD, Dr. Edward Taub did, was that he proved that without reflexes, you can still move. He proved? Yes, he did. Can we talk about that a little bit? Well, he did something called a dorsal root rhizotomy. He did. Oh, okay. And yeah, that thing. We already talked about that. Right, right. Okay. So even if you destroy the reflexive arc, you can still move. You can't feel the movement because you've destroyed the afferents that that give you the ability to feel the movement, but you can still move. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. It is. And we did talk about that. I think that was in episode one. It was the one on um, Learn Learn Mm Non-Use. Yeah. Learn Non-Use. Episode one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we were such children back then. Okay. So um, getting back to our explanation, um, one of the things that happens in vertebrates, it doesn't happen in invertebrates, is that one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body. So your right side of your body is controlled by the left side of your brain and vice versa. And I looked this up. Why does this happen? Nobody really knows. Um but it does happen in vertebrates, but in things that don't have a vertebrae, their right side is controlled by the right side of their central nervous system and vice versa. With us, it crosses over in the brain. So normally the brain on the right side would control, for instance, the left side biceps, the muscle that flexes your elbow that brings you into the Popeye muscle. But if there's a brain injury and that portion of the brain is dead, the spinal cord takes over and it controls it. Now in all the flexors, the flexors in every case are strong stronger than the extensors. So what happens is you get these very flex patterns. The elbows flex, the fingers are flex, the shoulders internal ro- rotated, uh, the gastroc and soleus, the, the calf muscles are flexed, the toe points down because it's flex, there's knee flexion, um, internal rotation of the hip, a bunch of stuff. So that's not a good thing because that leads to all kinds of problems. But yeah, what happens in spasticity is the spinal cord, which is a great messenger boy from the brain to the muscles, is now given sole responsibility for controlling the muscles because that part of the brain is dead. 
The spinal cord is a great messenger boy. It's a terrible brain because all it says is flex, 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 flex. So the reverse of that would be what me and John Farrell came up with, this neuroplastic model. And that's where we're headed. Now, here's the thing that confuses a lot of clinicians. Spasticity is not progressive. In MS, which is a progressive disease, yeah, spasticity is progressive in multiple sclerosis. But in brain injury, if it's a static brain injury, it's not getting worse over time. Spasticity is not progressive. But here's why it's so confusing. All the things that come from spasticity, like contracture, where the muscle is too tight to move at all, deformity, disability, and pain are progressive. So let's say somebody has soft tissue shortening. They have a muscle shortening and their elbow is kind of flexed. And the reason it's kind of flexed was, um, I don't know, maybe they were in a cast for a long, long time for whatever reason. And so they lose sarcomeres, the contractile units of muscles, and the muscle shortens. Okay, if you tried to range that muscle, it wouldn't matter how fast or slow you went. You would get the same amount of tension. Spasticity is velocity dependent. The faster you go, the more resistance you get. So spasticity is not progressive, but all those things that come from spasticity are progressive progressive. The velocity dependent thing is not progressive. The thing that's not velocity dependent, doesn't matter how slow or fast you go, those are progressive. Now, how would you tell the difference? Add speed. If you're a clinician and you're trying to tell if it's soft tissue shorting or if it's spasticity, add speed. If it doesn't matter the speed you're going, you know it's contracture. It's a shortening of the muscle. If it does matter, you know it's spasticity. Now, this is something that you alluded to before. Remember the Brunstrom stages of recovery from flaccid to full recovered. She had six of them, this really elegant arc. Well, the first three, look, there is something worse than spasticity. Flaccidity is worse. It means there's no muscle activity there at all. That's where the shoulder sublux, I think we talked about that in one of the podcasts. I think we did too. And I also think maybe that should be a separate episode. About flaccidity? Yes. Yeah, maybe it should. Mm -hmm. I'm not super knowledgeable about it because here's the thing about flaccidity. If they're flaccid for a couple of weeks after their brain injury, outcomes are very poor, extremely poor. It's the worst clinical sign that you can have. Not only that, but it damages the shoulder because the sits muscles. Remember, I remembered all the, all the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. All those muscles don't have any strength. Yeah. And so the head of the humerus, the humerus has so much weight, has all those muscles, and it just pulls it right out of the socket. So that's not good. So things could be worse. So spasticity at least gives you some strength. That's the other thing that you alluded to with one of your questions. Can we sometimes use spasticity? Absolutely. To uh, to do functional things. Yeah. I think about transfers. I mean, having some spasticity in a leg would make it possible for someone to bear weight, maybe even weight shift, and at least pivot for a transfer. So let's review. Flaccidity, as you progress through Brunstrom stages, spasticity is next. It's actually a progression. It means something's trying to get through from the spinal cord. One of the things that I think clinicians sort of don't understand is that the first thing that comes from the central nervous system after flaccidity has nothing to do with trace movement or electromyography or whatever it is that they're looking for. It's actually spasticity, like drop foot, okay? So they have drop foot. You want to know if the tibialis anterior, the muscle that lifts the foot at the ankle, it's a huge problem in people that have had stroke and brain injury. They have drop foot. That muscle doesn't work. If you want to know if something's coming back, hold them into dorsiflexion and bring them rapidly within one second for the entire joint. And if you get a quick catch and release, you know they're no longer flaccid. They now have something coming from the spinal cord. It's a huge difference. It's such a huge difference that the score changes on this Brunstrom Fugelmeyer test that we do as soon as that stuff shows up. So it is an immature protection mechanism. You probably have the prefer to have the arm flexed and across the chest than dangling down near the spokes of the wheelchair and getting all caught up. May induce Wolf's Law. Wolf's law was that in order for osteoblastic activity to happen, that is for for bones to stay very strong and thick, there has to be pull of the muscle on the bone. That's actually what lays down the osteoblast that, that gives bone bone is the muscles pulling. In fact, weightlifters, they have thicker bones because then that's what you're supposed to do with osteopretic little old ladies. You're supposed to get them in pumping iron. And With a flaccid limb, there's not going to be any pull of the muscle on the bone. But with a spastic limb, there will be. So they'll have thicker bones, less osteoporosis. I think we discussed this in the falls episode. Which way do they fall? They fall towards the weaker side. Which side is osteoporotic? The weaker side is. 
it substitutes for strength, something you pointed out for standing. You mentioned that walking, gripping, something I don't have on this list is the thing that you mentioned, transfers may improve circulation. So we talked about DVT just a minute ago, uh, deep vein thrombosis. That's what it stands for, right? Correct. Yeah, good. Phew. So they have a clot in their leg. Um, but the reason they get clots is that the blood pools down there because they don't have any strength in the gastroc and the soleus. People don't understand this, but venous return, return of blood back to the heart happens because of muscle contraction. Well, if you don't have those muscles, it's going to pool down there. They get swelling. It's kind of ugly, glassy skin, sometimes some pigment changes. But now if they had spasticity in the gastroc and the soleus, the calf muscles, it would push the blood back up. At least they got that. Look, I'm, I'm reaching here. I'm reaching for good news with spasticity. It's not, I'm not very convincing, but there you go. It maintains muscle bulk. That's true. Yeah. And probably the best news is it is a step in the right direction according to Brunson's six stages. So let's talk about if somebody gets stuck in a stage. Oh, okay. So that's not spasticity specific, but you know, that's a plateau. And I know you know that I think plateaus uh, or plat the word plateau is a dirty word when it comes to this because recovery is really, once they're chronic and they have that first big plateau, it's a series of smaller plateaus, which can make a ginormous difference in that person's life. Yeah. Uh, now, but, normally I like dirty words, but not plateau. No, plateau is a dirty word. Yeah. Not that one. I mean, the thing is though, where this does relate to spasticity is flaccidity will demand a plateau. Plateau, and then you're just trying to protect the shoulder. Like if they have flaccidity, you've got to protect the shoulder. You got to protect the arm. You know, I, I talked to a guy just the other day that was flaccid. It was the weirdest thing in the world because it was the right side that was flaccid and his brain surgery was on the right side of the brain. I'd never seen that before because usually it's the opposite side yeah. with this guy. And, and, he, and I've heard this before from stroke survivors. They'll say to me, they'll email me and they'll go, this arm isn't doing anything. It causes me nothing but pain. It's an embarrassment. I got to carry it around like it's a Siamese twin with no head. It's a horror show. Do you know of any doctors that will amputate it? I'm like, Ooh. no. But if you find one, you got to let me know who it is because we're going to report that guy. But they kind of have a point. It isn't doing anything. So flaccidity and spasticity will get in the way of recovery and will force a plateau. But I think for spastic people, we can help. Well, I can't wait to hear how. Is it, are, is it having something to do with your neuroplastic model? I would like to think so. But there's other things that you can do in the short term as well. So here's what happens. This is the big cycle that happens. Spasticity sets in. And when it does, the limb is used less. So if the limb is used less, that leads to learn non-use. So that portion of the brain starts to shrink. So when that portion of the brain starts to shrink, it's even harder to use the limb. And so that portion of the brain shrinks even more. And then it's used less. And then it shrinks more. And meanwhile, they get soft tissue shortening because the limb is held in some short and position at some muscles at least, and they get contracture. And contracture is taking muscle and turning it into fibrous tissue that's no longer extensible. It's no longer muscle. Even if you go in and you did an a biopsy of it, a puncture biopsy. It doesn't look like muscle. It looks more like tendon. So that's the whole cycle. So at some point, I want to talk about passive range of motion and maintaining the length, the importance of that. Then you're not going to like the rest of this. No, I'm going to like all of it. Okay. So we might get into this thing where some sacred cows are tipped. So let's I've never get officially gone cow tipping. <laughs> and if this is my first experience with it, I think I, I might like it. Yeah. So, you know, look, sometimes I have arguments with my daughter. Me and my daughter argue like cats and dogs. It's because we love each other. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that dads that don't argue with their kids and they're not doing them a whole. And I think mothers too. Yeah, you, you try each other and you try new ideas and with family members. And I forget what my point was. Oh, oh yeah. I'm like, I want to find if you are right and I am wrong. My daughter's name is Emma. If you're right and I'm wrong, look, that's good news for me because I just learned something. It may, I might fight you for a while, but keep at it if you know you're right. So we're going to, we're going to tip some sacred cows when it comes to what reduces spasticity. Okay. And this gets right to your point. What about ranging? What about stretching? You ready? Here we go. I'm ready. This comes from WebMD. 
A daily regimen of stretching can lengthen muscles to help decrease spasticity. Yeah. So it conflates two things. If you lengthen muscles, for instance, something that lengthens muscles is serial casting. Absolutely lengthens muscles. You haven't reduced spasticity. What so, happens after you serial cast is they, they're still spastic. And so they got to be serial casted again and again and again. It's an important thing to take care of because you don't want to lose sarcomeres. You don't want to lose length of that muscle because it turns into that fibrous tissue. But people often conflate lengthening muscles with decreasing spasticity. They're completely different things. You're really, if I understand this correctly, you're maintaining the length only. With serial casting. Yes, not with ranging. Let's see, because I got more. Okay. Last episode, we talked about research. And one of the best resources for meta-analysis is the Cochrane Review. Remember, Archie Cochrane, it was named after him, one of the fathers of evidence-based practice. And the Cochrane Review did a meta-analysis on stretching and whether it had an effect on the muscles of people with brain injury. In 2010, and we'll put this in the show notes, they found that stretch did not have clinically important effects on spasticity, pain, quality of life, joint mobility, or the treatment or prevention of contracture. That was 35 studies and almost 1,400 participants. Now, I do a lot of talks and clinicians like nothing else I talked about would get up in arms about this. They would say, well, what kind of stretch did they do? And they didn't do it right. I do contract, relax, slow, reverse, hold. And I do this other thing and it really works great. And, you know, that's tough. And I think what happened over at Cochrane is they got a lot of pushback as well. So they redid the study. I've never seen this before. In 2017, they did it again, and their conclusion was stretch does cause a transient extensibility in muscles. That is, they are loose right after the stretch, but you know as well as I do, as soon as they get up out of their chair, it's right back to where it started. As soon as they have a big volitional movement, the spasticity comes right back. These effects, according to the Cochrane Review, don't last for more than a few minutes. So we're wasting a good 20 minutes if we're we're passively ranging all the joints. It's tough. WebMD tells us it's the first line of defense. Well, I'm glad we're having this conversation. So I let's keep going. Yeah. I mean, there are good reasons to stretch, I would argue. Maybe you're hitting muscles that aren't spastic because there's a ton of muscles in the upper extremity. There's a ton of muscles uh, in the lower extremity. It feels good, but it's not going to do anything. It's not like normal muscle. Normal muscle, if you stretch a lot, you increase the number of sarcomeres. You increase the length of the muscle. In spastic muscles, for whatever physiological reason, that's just not in play. So we're not maintaining. We're not even maintaining a length. Not even maintaining. Yeah. And you know this because... Because if it was true that spasticity was reduced through a stretching program, we would just give everybody a grand stretching program and spasticity would be gone. What, are we all bad clinicians? No, we what? do it. It just doesn't do anything. I'm not thinking about it in terms of reducing spasticity. I'm thinking about it in terms of preventing a con- contracture. But yeah. that's not even true. That's not even true. Wow. If you buy into the research. Now, maybe this is the one time you want to say, I don't buy the research. I don't believe it. I I've got my own ideas and that's fine. That's what clinicians do. And that's what a stroke survivor and a person with brain injury and caregivers can do. Well, I'm why would you? Going, yeah. I'm sorry. Why would you do that with research that's been done twice just to check and make sure and the results are the same? It might be the first part of that sentence. There is a transient reduction in spasticity. So it might set you up to be able to do something you otherwise couldn't do. Okay. In 2017, they expanded it. And we're going to put a show link. A show link. Is that what you called? What we're going to put a link in the show notes. You know, a link in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you. Lincoln. A link in a, in the show notes. And um, and there's actually an audio that goes with it where one of the lead researchers at the Cochrane Review tells you what they found. And it's pretty amazing and pretty stark. Stretch was not effective for the treatment and prevention of contractures. 50 studies now, over 2,000 participants. It did not have effects on joint mobility and there was no effect on contracture formation. That sounds robust. So just to follow robust. follow through or follow up from our previous episode on research, robust is what we're looking for. Yeah. I mean, let's hope that they're wrong. I mean, this is, I don't know if you read this, but one of Einstein's ideas about black holes was just recently proven to be incorrect. That's what science does. And we've seen this with COVID. I mean, science 
doesn't move in a straight, beautiful, perfect line. That's what everybody thinks it does. It doesn't. It goes mm. up and down. So maybe we'll find out in 10 years that stretch does help. I don't know. Hmm. But one of the things that you may like reach out and want to throttle me about is something that OTs love, and that's splinting. And one of the things that they looked at in the Cochrane Review was splinting. They considered that a long, slow stretch. And you know what happens with these splints. They're static splints. So there'll be splints that will hold the fingers open, the wrist in a good position. They'll even go up the elbow. So there are other reasons for splinting, though, for just for comfort. Yeah, you might splint so that the fingernails don't dig into the palm of the mm-hmm. hand. Yeah. And I also wanted to ask if you know anything about the Dynapro splint, because those splints are supposed to move a little bit with the changes in muscle tone that occur you know, right. throughout the day or like night. Like the Dyna splint or Sabo has one, the Sabo stretch. Yeah. Yeah. So those are going to have the same problem. They, they don't hold the stretch long enough in order to increase the number of sarcomeres, lengthen the muscle. and But at least they're form-fitting. A lot of the, what's that stuff that you OTs use, the plast stuff? Yeah, thermoplast, those plastic splints. Thermoplast, right? I but hate those. You hate those because I they do. never fit. As oh. the person gets contracture, it's harder and harder to put that thing on and then their fingers dig into it and it, it can tear the joints, the small joints of the fingers. No, Not I don't know why people... St- I don't know if people still issue those. And if they do, I don't know why. Well, within the context of stretching, I just want you to know that was one of the things that the Cochrane Review considered stretching. Here's the thing. Serial casting does increase sarcomeric length. It does increase the length of the muscle. Why? If splinting doesn't, why does serial casting? There's a big difference. 48 hours. The fulcrum in which the muscle is remodeled is the stretch has to be held 48 hours or longer. And all these splints, you cannot ethically keep it on somebody for 48 hours Mm -hmm. because they can get all kinds of sores. Even with serial casting, you can have all kinds of problems with shearing of tissue and all kinds of problems. Problems. So it has to be looked at a lot. But yeah, even with splinting, not very effective. Didn't improve motor function, reduce spasticity, improve impairment, reduce disability, reduce nor prevent contracture. And this is the point at which OTs in the room start throwing pencils at me. They're like, oh, I missed you. Let me throw it again. I'm so well, sorry, but you know, it's it's sacred cow time. Tip the cows. Got the way the way I think about this is documentation. If we are going to splint someone, we should not be talking for those purposes that you just mentioned. Comfort, skin and maintain skin integrity, those are some things that we should be thinking about and just putting that in our documentation. I think that's friggin' brilliant. That's it's exactly right. You're doing it's- it for comfort, you're doing it for positioning, you're doing it so they don't get to cubit eye. All the things you said so they don't so yeah. That's the way you document. Yeah. Okay, let me talk about some other treatments and whether they work. Um, some of these work, but they're Band-Aids. As soon as you pull them off, they don't work anymore. Baclofen, intrathecal baclofen. Intrathecal baclofen is where there's a hockey puck sized canister embedded surgically into the abdomen and it squirts dosages that's controlled Bluetooth from outside the person's body. So the doctor can dose it. It goes into the intrathecal space at the level of the spasticity. So one of the problems with like oral baclofen and these other muscle relaxers is is they're systemic. They go everywhere and you end up exhausted because you're tired and all your muscles end up weak. Whereas intrathecal baclofen goes specifically to the muscles that you want to hit. So that's good. The problem is the dosing is very difficult to get right. And I've seen people just absolutely slump down because the intrathecal baclofen dose was too high. Then there's oral meds like Baclofen and Xanaflex, but they're systemic. And if you pull them away, they're not going to work anymore. Neurolytics like Botox. Here's the thing about Botox. What we're headed towards, I'm hoping, is my neuroplastic model, me and John Farrell. And um, and neurolytics deaden the muscle. It's temporary. It's Botox, for instance, is botulinum toxin. It's a toxin. It goes into the muscle. And for two or three months, it relaxes the muscle. And that's great. And in that time that it works, if it's done right, it can make people more functional. Now, it used to be there was Botox A and Botox B. And you would develop an immunity bo- to Botox A. And so they'd switch you over to Botox B. Um, but since then, they've developed all a hundred different kinds of Botox. So nobody ever gets immune to any of them. And so people are on Botox forever. And it's expensive. And it's painful. And it means that you never are able to leverage the great neuroplastic brain that you have to reestablish brain control over those muscles because they're always paralyzed. 
Also, little known fact, and it's something that Allergan, the company that makes Botox, doesn't want to tell anybody. There are much less expensive neurolytics. There's alcohol blocks, and they cost literally one one hundredth the cost of Botox. They're used around the world. It's just that Allergan is such a heavy hitter. Why? It's not because of the spasticity stuff. It's because of the wrinkle reduction stuff. And that wrinkle reduction stuff makes them billions of dollars per quarter. I've looked at their financials. You know what? I'm probably going to get my internet attacked by Allergan. They're a big 600 pound gorilla. They're coming Quite after possible. me. Yeah, we, we did a lot of clinical trials with Allergan and it's a great company. And for the right kind of patient at the right time, perfectly legitimate. It's just when they're on forever, what are you headed towards? And you can't get at this, you can't leverage the great neuroplastic brain if they're always weakened in that muscle. Then there's neurosurgery. Now here's one bright light. Neurosurgery, it's called a dorsal root rhizotomy. And I've talked to adults that have had this. And what they do is they go in and they pick out, you know how like the brachial plexus comes in, the nerves from the arm, and right before it gets to the spinal cord, it breaks up into rootlets. They look like very fine blonde hairs. And I will put a link in the show notes of the surgery being done. And if you can tolerate it, it's a small incision and they're usually up and around the next day. That's how small it is. And they very selectively cut those rootlets. They don't eliminate the spasticity because you need some muscle control. You could cut everything and they would be insensate and they couldn't move it at all. But that's not what you want. But because those rootlets, there's thousands of them going in there, because the neurosurgeon can be very selective with them, it's called a selective dorsal root rhizotomy. And I've had adults that have profound spasticity where they're getting decubiti, you know, these are bed sores, where they're just in agony constantly. And they go in and they do this and they say, it's the first time in 25 years I've had a decent night's sleep because I'm able to position myself. Now, why don't people talk? Talk about this more. It's permanent. It's non-reversible. But if it's done right, it's a great relief. Have you ever seen somebody with CP just in agony and trying to stretch out of stuff? It's horror show. Dorsal root rhizotomy. Selective dorsal root rhizotomy. Ask your local neurosurgeon about that one. Then another surgery that does work is called tendon lengthening. So this is when they have contracture and their hand or their fingers are all bunched up. They can lengthen the tendons by cultivating tendon material from someplace else and lengthening it in much the way they do with ACL repair, for instance. And then there's rehab therapy. And this is, again, where this neuroplastic model comes in. And I think I can give a great tool to clinicians and to survivors that might be able to help them. Okay, so serial casting, that lengthens muscles. Dorsal root rhizotomy, that's permanent. Cold reduces spasticity. You know why? It slows down the monosynaptic stretch reflex. And if you can slow it down, in fact, that's the way they measure it. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the measurement that they do. Think of it in a sec. What is it? It's called the H reflex. And they measure the speed of that reflex. And the faster it goes, the worse the, worse the spasticity. It's a very quantifiable way of measuring spasticity. And cold slows that down. So cold works. But here's the problem. It takes 10 to 60 minutes. 10 minutes in thinner patients up to 60 minutes in more obese people in order for it to slow that down. And there's an initial increase in spasticity because everybody hates cold. With time though, there's an ultimate decline in spasticity. The effects of cold application are thought to last 20 to 30 minutes. So the question becomes- time. Go ahead. What's that? Go ahead. I mean, the question is, is it worth your time? Well, what are you doing in that 20 to 30 minutes following the cold? What if, oh, what are you doing? You're doing the stuff that they can do now that they couldn't do with all that spasticity. So so they're gaining more function during that 20 during to 30 that minutes. time. Yeah. Now that could lead to neuroplastic change, which then might lend itself to this neuroplastic model. You know, if you're an outpatient and go, Mr. Smith, look, you're here a little bit early. Let me throw a cold pack on that arm. And then when you come in, you'll have a reduction in spasticity. Hey, uh, tech, just watch Mr. Smith. Okay. Ask him every two minutes. All right. Is it cold? Is it, is it driving you nuts? We'll take it off if we have to, but let's see if we can get a cold. And then when you come in for treatment, you'll be a little less spastic. Heat lies to you in exactly the opposite direction. There's an initial reduction in spasticity because you relax systemically when you have the warm, but then because it increases the speed of the monosynaptic stretch reflex, it actually makes spasticity worse. Yep. It makes spasticity more efficient. You can look at it that way. Is that something else that clinicians throw their pencils at you for? 
Not, not as much. I think they're okay with that. It's the splinting and the stretching. That's where the pencils come a flying. Sometimes tomatoes and whatever they had for lunch, and vitriol. And no, they, they're usually pretty cool about it. You know, worst comes to worst, they go, I disagree with you. And then we move on. Next slide. <laughs> and you mentioned, you asked about uh, e-stim. So you can use e-stim in a couple of ways. First of all, you can e-stim the heck out of the overwhelmingly strong flexors. So all the muscles that bring the hand into a fist, you e-stim the heck out of them until they can't move anymore. And then you can work on extension. So that's one way. You can also maybe use it, and I think we talked about this before, e-stim, depending on where you put the electrodes, drive neuroplastic change in the brain. So you could lean towards this neuroplastic model by doing e-stim of the muscles that are spastic. You could engender reciprocal inhibition. So uh, in order for you to extend your elbow, to straighten your elbow, the triceps contract, but the biceps, the muscles that bend the elbow, have to relax. And that's called reciprocal inhibition. It does it does it without you even thinking about it. It's done through the spinal cord. It's one of the responsibilities of the spinal cord. Otherwise, you'd be fighting your own muscles. You'd have a co-contraction. So you could e-stim the elbow extensors and the flexors would relax. Once you take the e-stim off, again, you have about 20 or 30 minutes of less spasticity. Here's another little thing about Botox. If you e-stim the muscles that were Botox, Botox usually takes about seven to 10 days to get into the muscle. It takes two days. So it goes from a week to 10 days down to two days. There's something about e-stim that it increases the speed of the uptake of the Botox. And you do it by doing e-stim directly to the muscles that were Botox. But here's the deal. If you get Botox, don't listen to me. Talk to your physiatrist. Talk to the guy or the woman, whoever it was, they did the Botox before you start putting Eastim on those muscles because they may, you might get back to them and they may be like, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have talked to me first. Who told you to do that? Well, it was noggins and neurons. No, don't say that. Go back to your doctor and make sure it's okay. Or run it. If you need the research, we'll put it in the show notes and you can just show it to them and see if it works for you. So what works? What doesn't work? Splinting, at least equivocal. Dynamic bracing doesn't seem to work because it doesn't hold the stretch long enough. Although, you, as you mentioned, it might be really good for positioning and protecting. E-STEM has some potential. Intrathecal baclofen does work, but it's a Band-Aid. Oral meds, they work, but they're a Band-Aid. Dorsal root mesotomy does work, and it's not a Band-Aid, and it's permanent. And for the right kind of person, talk to your local neurosurgeon, I'm telling you. Stretching has a short-term effect. I would still say do it, but it feels good. You might be stretching muscles that are not spastic, that are within the same muscle group, so it's probably not a bad thing to do. And besides, you're going to stretch your unaffected side or your better side or whatever. Anyway, cold reduces spastic spasticity temporarily. Heat exacerbates spasticity temporarily. And then there's this neuroplastic model. So let's get into that. So the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. And normally that's the way it happens. If there's a brain injury on the right side of the brain controlling the left side of the body, that brain cannot control those muscles anymore. And so the spinal cord takes over. And as I mentioned before, the spinal cord is a really bad brain. It only says flex, 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 flex. What if we were to reestablish brain control over those muscles? How do we do that, Pete? How do we do that? Yeah. But it often, as we mentioned in one of these podcasts, it's often on the wrong side of the brain. It's on the ipsilateral side. So instead of the contralateral side doing its job, the ipsilateral side takes over the same side. So now the left side of the brain is controlling the left side of the body. Or if your spasticity is on the other side, it happens in the opposite direction. That would be good. That's the neuroplastic model. Okay, but as you say, how do we get there? So imagine somebody has a very flexed hand. What are you supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to stretch them. We're supposed to be cold and maybe some yeast them into the reciprocal inhibition. And we do all these things and they never seem to work. The one thing that you know that they have is finger flexion. Often they're fisted. People will call it the fist of death. You know, sometimes it's bilateral and people that have brain injury where both limbs are affected. Now, the one thing that they do have is finger flexion. And often therapists say you cannot let them flex the fingers because if you do, you will strengthen the overwhelmingly strong flexors. And if you do that, you will make spasticity worse, which is not true. Spastic muscles are weak. So even if you strengthen them, it wouldn't be the end of the world. But you're not trying to strengthen them. You're just trying to activate them. How are you going to reestablish brain control over the finger flexors if you don't allow them to flex the fingers? 
But what about a ball, a squishy ball? Who doesn't like a squishy ball? You squish into the ball. It reestablishes brain control over the flexors, thereby reducing spasticity. That's the whole thing. That's why me and John Farrell, between the first and second day of my talk, we went out drinking because this guy is like the hardest drinking, hardest smoking guy I've ever met. And he's pulling out his laptop and he's showing me all this stuff. And we're going, we came to the same conclusion from different perspectives. Because the other way that you can do this is constraint-induced therapy. Constraint-induced therapy doesn't care if you're using muscles that are spastic or not. Ed Taub doesn't care about that stuff. He just says, move, move as much as possible. If you move as much as possible, you reestablish brain control over those spastic flexors and the extensors. Here's the dirty little secret about the extensors. They're also spastic. You just never see their spasticity because the flexors are taking over and that's all that reveals itself because they're so much stronger. Yeah. Who doesn't wow. like a squishy ball? I know. I'm not going to lie. I have been one of those therapists. It's like talking against the squishy ball. Never again. When I worked at Kessler, one of my first jobs was to go into the big gym and recruit stroke survivors. So I would look around. I'd be like a bird of prey. And I'd walk into the room and the therapist go, oh, it's the guy from research. He wants stroke survivors. And I would find, and you could always tell the stroke survivors, even if they were in the waiting room, they always had a tennis ball in their hand and they were squeezing that tennis ball. And then OTs would say, you shouldn't have that tennis ball because if you have the tennis ball in your hand, you're going to strengthen the overwhelmingly strong flexors and you'll make the, sp- the flexors more spastic. The thinking was, if you strengthen them, you'll make them, but there's no relationship between strength and spasticity. And those flexors are weak anyway. So you may as well do it. But I would not suggest a tennis ball. It just doesn't move very much. You should get as much range of motion as you can to squish into that ball. Then it's just a matter of finding a ball that will reopen the hand so you can squish it again. Was it last episode we did repetitive practice? Yes. And maybe sort well, of- Well, two episodes two, ago. Two episodes ago. And maybe sort of I convinced somebody maybe somewhere that 1,200 repetitions was a good number to start with. So those are the kinds of numbers you're talking about. Is it going to be ugly for a while? Yeah. Is it going to lead to delayed onset muscle soreness? Yeah, it is. Should you talk to your clinician first? Heck yeah, you should. But this is the neuroplastic model. Now, everybody who's ever seen- somebody with bilateral arm involvement or who's had a stroke, you always see this typical hemiparetic posture and it's shoulder internal rotation. Basically, um, the only thing is you're stabbing yourself in the heart with a knife. That's what it looks like. Okay. What if you wanted to hit all those muscles that cause that posture in the first place using this neuroplastic model? Well, that would be pretty simple. It would be, um, you got to help me describe this movement. What is this? So So your shoulder, your shoulders. Okay. So your arm, the humerus is tucked alongside your body and you're bringing your forearm out into external rotation and back into internal rotation so that your forearm is going away from your body and towards your body. Right. Perfect. Like a swinging door. Yeah. But the, but the money shot here is coming towards your body. The weight that you have on the machine on the other side or the TheraBand or whatever the heck it is, is only to reopen your arm so you can stab yourself in the heart again. So you can do this using something, some kind of a tool. So you're talking about TheraBand. So are we putting TheraBand on a a hook somewhere? Yeah, like a TheraBand on a hook. Okay. And then as they come towards their body, they're reestablishing brain control. And then the TheraBand will then let them open again. Wow. All those muscles that don't work, they actually do work, but they're being overwhelmed by the stronger flexors. So the TheraBand is assisting. Yes. To, to set them up for another repetition. Yeah. Or I always think about the the machines that are counterweighted through mm-hmm. a pulley. Yeah. And so you pull it towards you and then it reopens your arm. But if you want to get rid of that hemiparetic posture, that may be the way to go because it hits all those muscles all at once, except for the finger flex. So something like that, I would probably have a therapist help you set that up initially so that there's not too much weight yanking your arm fast and furious away from your body and causing some damage, but get that set up and you could do that at home. Yeah. And that's why the disclaimer at the front of our show isn't there for show. It's no. there because we're you absolutely have to go to a therapist to set this up. It doesn't mean that you couldn't do it at home once it's set up. That's what the home exercise program is all about. You could do all those repetitions at home and not burn through a lot of clinical time. The therapist will love you for it, but you just got to do it safely. Yeah, Pete, I was so inspired by all of our conversations about the home program that I wrote a blog about it. Oh, are you going to share that with me or what up? Yeah, I will share that with you. I'll stick that in the show notes too. I wrote it to therapists because 
that's the majority of what I do is support therapists, but I do that so that survivors are supported too. So, you know, if you're a survivor and you're hearing all of this information, definitely talk to your doctor or your therapist about this, get their feedback, their input and their assistance. Yeah. I'm going to put the whole neuroplastic model as I've written it down. Uh, maybe I'll take it out of my book or but maybe I'll take it from a blog entry just so that you have a little bit of the research behind it because there is quite a bit of research behind it. So there wasn't when I first came up with this and me and John were drunk, but there is now. So the goal is to increase cortical representation, brain representation of those spastic muscles. It may seem counterintuitive, but repetitive practice of spastic muscles reduces spasticity. Repetitive practice increases brain representation Representation, increasing brain representation decreases spasticity. That's the neuroplastic model. Now, we talked about the upper extremity, but what about the lower extremity? What's the bugaboo here? Drop foot, often caused by spastic. It's two muscles, the gastroc and soleus, but the calf muscles. So what you would do is activate the overwhelmingly strong plantar flexors, the muscles, the calf muscles that bring the foot down. And you can do this like if you can imagine uh, an accelerator on a car, you would push into the accelerator and then the accelerator would have enough pushback in order to allow you to accelerate in again, reestablishing brain control over the muscles that are pushing down the accelerator, which are the calf muscles. Now, if you do it in a car, you're going to flood the engine, even if the car is off. So don't do it. You know what you need. You need an electric car that's turned off because then you don't have to worry about flooding the engine. So you need a Tesla to do this or, or a TheraBand. You either need a Tesla or a TheraBand. Either one will work. It's an old joke. So there's a bunch of research and it's building every day that says that this neuroplastic model is probably the way to go. Um, and I'm going to post all of these in there. They fall into two broad categories. What happens if we go after just that muscle? And the other category is what happens when constraint induced therapy comes on board and the therapists get out of their own way and let them move as much as possible, no matter how ugly it is, no matter how spastic it is, what happens to spasticity? And every time they measure spasticity within the context of constraint induced therapy, there's a reduction, a reduction, a reduction of spasticity. Use it and loose it. Use the spastic muscle, loose the spasticity or lose the spasticity. Very clever. Very clever I am. You yeah. are very clever. Yes, I'm telling you. So I think we've come to the end of our little program today. I didn't even get to the assessment part. Like, how do you measure this stuff? But um, maybe another day we'll do that. Yeah, maybe we can do that next time. Are you as hungry as I am? I'm getting hungry. What is it again. about these things? Maybe we need to do them in the morning or something. Because I am I agree with you. I'm starved at the end of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of thinking. Yeah. I mean, the brain, brain power. It makes no sense. It just uses a ton of calories. That's why students put on a few pounds. You know, they think all the time. Yeah. It makes you hungry. That's, see, that's, what is the freshman 15? Something like that. That's right. I got like the COVID 30 going on here. It's like... <laughs> Anyway, I had a ball. I'm I did too. Need to go Pete. eat. Thank you so much, Deb. Thank you. And thanks for listening, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. We appreciate your support and would love to hear from you. Ask us questions and share your thoughts by email at nogginsandneurons at gmail.com. That's noggins, the word and, spelled out, neurons at gmail.com. If you like what you heard, please share this podcast with others you think will benefit. Also be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll catch you next time on Noggins and Neurons, Stroke and TBI Recovery Simplified.